Okay, yeah. I think this might be a good time. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Usher, uh, who is going to be our MC for today. And I'll sort of be spotlighting people as they talk. So if you sort of see your screen shift, that is me. Um, I'll try not to give anybody whiplash. Um, but yeah, I'll hand out uh, over to Usher. So here we go. Thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, on behalf of the Embassy Cultural House, welcome to the official Zoom launch for Pandemic Gardens, Resilience Through Nature. I just wanna preface the event by saying that we are aiming to be around an hour, um, but do please bear with us if we go a little bit over. Um, we completely understand if you have other commitments, so uh, feel free to leave um, if you'd like at the hour mark or earlier. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, on the sunny, albeit chilly Saturday. It's wonderful to see everyone's glowing faces. Um, happy Chinese New Year to everyone that celebrated. Happy Groundhog Day. Um, it's also February, which means it's Black History Month, um, a very important initiative that recognizes the uh, history of peoples from the African diaspora. I think it's also a very important time for us to sort of take a step back and reflect on where we're standing with our fellow human beings. Um, as Jamie Hassan actually noted, every month is Black History Month. Every month should be Black History Month. Um, it's definitely a very important initiative that enables us to work together no matter where we're from, where we belong, what we look like, what we believe in, just working together for a better world, for a more equal world, for a greener world. Um, and uh, greener world, um, I just wanna say a special thank you to all of our wonderful con contributors without whom Pandemic Gardens wouldn't be possible. Um, your work is absolutely mesmerizing and we at the Embassy Cultural House are extremely grateful for um, your participation in this online exhibition. Um, a special, a very, very special thank you also goes out to Ron Benner and Rachel McGillary, who are the organizers of this exhibition. Um, also with immense assistance from Joanna Wheel, uh, Jamily Hassan and Olivia Masudo. Um, and that being said, I want to hand things over to Ron Benner and Rachel McGillivray, our organizers. They'll be saying a few words. Um, so yeah, take it away, Ron. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel and I have been in a, a, a Zoom dialogue now for uh, off and on for six months. And through um, Zoom and uh, email, uh, we got to know each other through um, Connection Artist Run Center in Fredericton. So I, I'm in London, Ontario, and Rachel's just outside of Fredericton. And um, so before uh, July, we had never met, and uh, it was uh, it was it 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 was supposed to, I think, be a mentorship where I think I was the mentor and uh, Rachel was the mentee. But uh, it didn't work out that way. I, I, um, I learned uh, so much from Rachel over uh, the past few months. And uh, so, uh, Rachel, do you want to say a few words? Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks. I guess, first of all, Ron is way too humble. He's an amazing mentor. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess, so I'm... I uh, met Ron through the mentorship program with Connection ARC, and I definitely was very intimidated um, before I met him by, you know, knowing that he had, you know, advised PhD students at the university. And then I had my first meeting with Ron and just realized how incredible he is and just that, yes, this was going to be a really wonderful, um, amazing experience. And it has been. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for how much work has been put into this. I mean, it would not be able to have happened without Ron and Jamili and Olivia and Joanna. And, um, you know, for me, meeting uh, everyone at the ECH, I think like John, um, Ron's generosity has just been multiplied by everyone here. Um, it's an incredible supportive community um, that's been built. And I think that that's what we need in this world um and it's just like a a shining kind of beacon and um you know I, I think one of the hardest things about the pandemic it has been really hard is that lack of connection with people and sort of our loss of community and that isolation and i think a lot of people did turn to reconnecting with nature connecting more with nature um and 
thank you all for sharing your experiences. And I also just think like going through um, this exhibition online, it just, I do feel the stirrings of like hope and it feels unlifting, just uplifting to just, you know, read all of your stories and your contributions. And I love that, that, you know, we were in isolation and we turned to our plants and gardens and nature and our artwork. And then in sharing that with one another, it's just like another community connection. Um, so just thank you to everyone for taking part. Olivia, Jamili, Ron, and Joanna, thank you so much for the work you put into it. And just thanks for welcoming me into your ranks. That's all. And thanks, Ron. Just thanks, for Rachel. <laughs> and uh, just a, another <clears throat> thank you, I think, is uh, our son, Tarek, who uh, is coming in from uh, Kuwait. And uh, it was through Tarek that uh, I, I was sharing uh, uh, Rachel's emails to me uh, with Tariq back in July, and, and I was saying, "Boy, these emails are so poignant." They're um, where Rachel was, you know, struggling with her um, creative processes, and and it was through gardening that she seemed to survive with her son Duncan. And uh, Tariq and I just both looked at each other and said, "Uh oh." Here, here's another project. <laughs> so it's always, you know, Tarek, uh, he has a light bulb above his head that I see glittering all the time. And, uh, yeah, it's a good one. But uh, this, this morning, this morning I woke up and, and the Cardinal, the Cardinal was singing for the first time. So what a great, uh, this uh, project uh, was, uh, you know, six months in, in the making, but uh, uh, the, the launch today is perfect, actually, because the Cardinals uh, are, are singing. And uh, so without uh, uh, further ado, I'd like to um, uh, just say that uh, uh, decolonization is natural. And uh, the best way to welcome everyone is through uh, our friends, Dan and Mary Lou Smoke, who have been friends of ours for over 30 years. And uh, uh, Dan and Mary Lou are elders in the uh, uh, our community, both for First Nations people and, and for uh, ourselves. Uh, uh, and they are guardians of the land and uh, water. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dan and Mary Lou Smoke to uh, welcome everyone. Oh. Hey, miigwech. Hey, miigwech. Nyawe. Where I come from, when we greet one another, we say bujo. So bujo. Bujo. My spirit name is Shooting Star Woman. I'm Bear Clan and I originally come from Batchewana Bay, Ontario, which is on beautiful Lake Superior. And I'm very honored to share some of the teachings that I've learned throughout my lifetime. And most of that time I've been walking beside this guy here. Uh, we're gonna celebrate being married 45 years this summer. And, but we lived together for almost five years before that because that's what the hippies did way back then. Mm -hmm. So we've been together all this time. And so what we really loved to do when we were young was to spend time together. And whenever any elders came, at that time we lived in Toronto where we met. Um, and then if any elders came to Toronto or if ceremonies were happening or there was social dancing or uh, powwows or anything that happened, we went there because we love to participate in those gatherings. And so uh, we found out that we had this mutual love for the culture and traditions of our people, even though we didn't know that much about it because uh, when I was growing up, we weren't taught about things because of the residential school. And I didn't know until later that my mom went to a residential school. And so that's why I understood why we didn't, why we didn't have, um, you know, things to smudge with, why we didn't have an eagle feather, you know. My mom would always kind of um, sneak a braid of sweet grass and smudge our car whenever we traveled, but she would always make sure nobody was looking, you know. So I guess she didn't want to get caught. But I didn't know how how bad it was to be a native person back then, you know. If you got found out, if they caught you doing that, you could be in trouble. You know, it wasn't until the 60s that those things started changing. And our people were placed on the reservations and we were supposed to um, never practice any of our traditional ways. But our elders would 
go way off in the bush in the middle of the night. They would go way back in the bush, like walk an hour back. And they would have sweat lodge ceremonies and shaking tent ceremonies. And they would sing and drum. And the Indian agent was never aware of this because he was sleeping. His job during the day was to make sure that the native people stayed on those reservations. So he did his job. And then my elders, my relatives, they did their work at night. And that's how come we still have the teachings today. That's why the ceremonies are still with us because they, they shared them with the generations back then. So when I was 17, I was very fortunate that I could go to an ecumenical conference out in Morley, Alberta, and it changed the way I walk. I hadn't met Dan yet, but I did have my fortune told by a native man when I was 17. And he told me that I was gonna marry a man from his reserve and he was from Six Nations. And I said, no way. I said, I'm marrying an Ojibwe man because you know I grew up with Ojibwe people. And it wasn't long after that I met Dan. And um, anyway, when I was out in Morley, Alberta, it was the first time that the old people brought out the medicines and the pipes, and uh, they brought up all the ceremonial things that we needed for, for the ceremonies, and they showed it to the non-native clergy of the world. They showed that our way is as legitimate as their way. And so from that time, that's when the ceremonies started happening. People got brave and started doing ceremonies in the cities. You know, um, when you would go to a sweat lodge way back in the 70s, the elders wouldn't do them till midnight or one o'clock in the morning because they were used to having to do them at that time. So nowadays, elders and people my age, we do them in the afternoon because I don't know if this happens to everybody, but when you get a little older, I kind of don't feel right for a couple of days if I stay up too late. So I always try to keep track of my hours, you know? So it's just an adjustment, right? Anyway, I'm gonna let Dan introduce himself. Okay, uh, Mayor Lou. Yeah, we? Sure. Yes, I'd just like to uh, open like with a, a, a deep gratitude to the Embassy Cultural House, uh, Ron and Jamili, whom we've known for uh, the 32 years that uh, Ron was talking about. Actually, it was because of uh, their son, uh, Terry, that uh, we met. And so uh, it was it was really it was it's been a really nice, long lasting friendship that uh, we have we have learned from each other. And we've done a lot of uh, miles on the road, traveling, done some ceremony, uh, but uh, some of the things we got to experience together has just been, uh, we, could, we could write a book about it, really. Anyways, uh, yeah, so as Mary Lou said, uh, yeah, our, our, our meeting was meant to be. It, 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 I, I seriously believe that. And I'm just so happy that when it did happen, it happened at the right time in both of our lives. And uh, as we began this journey together, of seeking out the knowledge and wisdom of our elders, we started to uh, started looking for teachers, and uh, teachers are very important in our in our way of life. Uh, we have a saying that says, uh, "When the student is ready, the teacher will appear." And uh, you know, like we just happened to meet people that uh, all of a sudden just appeared out of nowhere, and uh, next thing we knew, we had uh, like uh, Ron was talking about. Uh, mentorship with uh, Rachel you know we had this we had this uh, mentorship with these elders who who took the time to share with us and explain things to us and uh, I, you know to me just just communicating that was medicine for me and just learning about that and then when we actually got to participate in the ceremonial earth-based uh, events of you know that we've been doing for the past uh, 30 well over over that 40 years now mm -hmm. that we've been going to ceremony. Uh, once we started doing that, it, it, just, it just changed us, changed our lives, changed our outlook, changed our relationship with the natural world. We recognize that the natural world is, uh, is, is was put here. Uh, everything that we need is right here. Uh, all we have to do is be grateful. All we have to do is uh, keep it clean. All we have to do is uh, make sure we only take that which we need, not which we want. And we have to take care of each other. That, those, that's the main, that's the main uh, reason why we're here in this, the Great Lakes watershed, we call it. But uh, Mary Lou's people were hunter-gatherers. My people were, were farmers, uh, but they coexisted. 
they, they coexisted side by side and uh, got along. And uh, who knew that uh, from that, that time, way long time, you know, that must have been about, uh, I would say 800, 900 AD, uh, when they were gathering right here in the, in the Great Lakes watershed, that, uh, you know, that we would come together. We would, we would meet with one another in, of all places, Toronto, which was like a homeland for the Seneca people. But uh, we, uh, uh, we now we've, we've we've just been on this journey together that uh, I think uh, has benefited us and has benefited uh, our our families and uh, our people around us. You know, so it's uh, it's all been good. So, did you want to sing a song, Mary Lou? Yes, I was going to introduce a song. Sure. Um, we live in, uh, in the Deshkan ZB area, and that means Antler River. There are three local reservations around here. There is the Oneida, which is right outside of London. And right across the river from there is the Chippewa, the Thames. And then there's Lene, Lenape, the Moravian towns. And then for a little further, there's Wapal Island. They're all Anishinaabe, Potawatomi, and then Kettle Point. Um, they're all Anishinaabe too. But a lot of people don't realize that Dan and I have a mixed marriage because I'm from the Council of Three Fires, which is the Ojibwe, and he is from the Iroquois Confederacy. So we have kind of harmonized the way of our people and that's what we share with you. So um, this is a song that we always sing to honor the water. Water is the lifeblood of our mother, the earth. From the time that we're conceived, we're in water and that water protects us as we grow and develop. And when it's time for us to be born, we come out into the world. And from that time on, we need pure, clean water. Women are in harmony with the water and women are in harmony with the moon. Every 28 days, the moon shows her face and every 28 days, a woman has a purification cycle. So we women always gather at the full moon time and have a ceremony around a fire. For the last two years, uh, we've been having our fire inside here using a little yellow candle. And um, you know we've been on Zoom, you know, doing uh, full moon ceremonies for different communities. But we started doing them out at the sugar bush and we're going to be doing them in person if people want to come out to that but we're not sure about february yet because of the the covid numbers but anyway we always get together and we honor ourselves because we're women and because we have that harmony with the water and with the moon the moon causes the gravitational pull in the water and that causes the waves what causes churning and that churning causes the water to go down to the bottom where the sand is. And so it spins around at the bottom. And that is a natural filtration process that mother earth has created. A lot of corporations have dumped stuff in our water that mother earth can't clean. So we have to stand up for the water. We have to speak for the water and we have to take care of the water to make sure that the next seven generations are going to have water. So we always like to, pee, uh, to share the water song with people. And we also uh, like to give them this YouTube, YouTube site you can go to, which is Mary Lou Smoke. Um, and I'm singing this song at Harborfront a few years ago. So what did they do, just key in your name? Yeah, just key in my name, Mary Lou Smoke. Chita do ya do ya do ya. What you ta do ya do ya hey. What you ta do ya do ya do ya. What you ta do ya do ya hey. Hey ya tonight ya hey ya hey ya. Hey ya tonight ya hey ya hey. Hey ya tonight ya hey ya hey ya. Hey ya tonight ya.
means all my relations in the Lakota language. I'm also um, Lakota, Mi'kmaq, and French, <clears throat> as well as mostly Anishinaabe, Ojibwe. So now Dan is going to share with you the Thanksgiving address, and he's going to do the Condensed Reader's Digest version. Yes, Yes, Nyawe, Sagwao Sanio, there's quite a house, keep going on. Wah, ha, say, shall we say, do dark, wah, Oscata, Nagohas, O Ida, the Nahas. Grandfather, grandmother, hear our sacred thoughts, hear our sacred prayers as we bring our good minds and our good intentions into the circle today for the, for the pandemic gardens of the Embassy Cultural House gathering of all the artists who are gathered here today. We are very grateful for their presence to be beaming in from all over the place. I think they're from, uh, you know, from around, probably around the world. And uh, yeah, because Ron was talking about Mexico, you know, so that's, uh, that's, that's great that uh, we're all tuning in at this, at the same time. So anyways, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, the water. Uh, Mary Lou spoke for it, so I don't have to elaborate too much on the water. The lifeblood of Mother Earth, feminine, sacred element of life. All creation needs it in order to survive. Nothing would survive without the water. Plus, Water is still following her sacred instructions. So she's still doing that, still taking care of us. Also want to acknowledge all the life that lives in the water and all the life that lives on the water. For they are also helping to take care of the water and being taken care of by the water. I want to acknowledge the other feminine sacred element of life, Mother Earth. All the life that lives in her, all the life that lives on her. The crawlers, the four-legged beings, the two-legged beings, us human beings, the plant beings, the medicines, the rocks, the minerals, the trees, all the life that lives in the trees and all the life that lives on the trees. For they are all part of an interdependent, interconnected, interrelated life support system that continues to take care of Mother Earth. And Mother Earth is also still following her sacred instructions for nothing would survive without her. Grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. Mm -hmm. We acknowledge our Father's sky. Our Father's sky represents the air. And our Father's sky continues to breathe that life into all creation. Nothing would survive without our Father's sky, who's still following his sacred instructions, grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. We also want to acknowledge our grandmother moon, our grandmother moon, who, as, as you mentioned, Mary Lou, shows her face every 28 days. And when she does, she uh, actually, she looks after all female life and uh, she takes care of the water. So she's uh, actually recycling the water. She's purifying the water, cleansing the water. So that's very important work. So nothing would survive without our grandmother moon and she's still following her sacred instructions. We also want to acknowledge our eldest brother, the sun, who's up there right now, right above us, practically. But uh, now's a good time to be doing this opening ceremony uh, because uh, we, want to, we want the creator to witness that we are here doing the creator's work in the kind of uh, uh, raising awareness that we are doing here uh, through the arts and through this uh, creative outlet that we have, we have all been blessed with, but some of us are, use it a little bit more. 
but uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, you know when we when we talk about the uh, eldest brother, the sun, he travels across the sky from the eastern door across to the western door. Uh, he provides us with heat. And he provides us with light. He represents fire. Nothing would survive without fire. Nothing. And he is still following his sacred instructions, grandfather, grandmother, so be it in our minds. Uh -huh. We also want to acknowledge the star relatives for they remind us when it's time for us to conduct our ceremonies of Thanksgiving. We have people who already know or who have known who have been taught or apprenticed and learned how to read the stars because we, uh, according to our creation story, we are star people. But uh, in, in regards to the star knowledge, they tell us that the uh, we've passed the, the middle of winter. We're now into uh, longer, longer days, uh, shorter nights, coming upon that time when the, uh, the thunderers, who I will also acknowledge at this time, the thunder beings, it's their job is to wake up and shake up creation, and the cycle of creation is about to begin. And they will be here in the, in the time of the thunder moon around February, March. And that's their job is to wake up the earth, let the earth know that the next cycle has begun and it's time for us to get ready. And for us human beings, the way we know that it's, it's this is a, a good time for us is the, is the maple sap starts to run. And the maple sap is a medicine. It's the first medicine that comes from mother earth in each cycle of creation. And we're supposed to drink a glass of maple sap a day for one month's time, one lunar period. And if we do that, then our, our blood becomes fortified with, uh, with zinc, with um, iron, you know, magnesium, all these good things, all these organic uh, chemical elements that come right from Mother Earth and comes up to us in the form of this medicine. And all we have to do is give thanks and, and drink it. And our blood will become fortified with that. And so that we can go out and start to prepare the land, we can go out and start to prepare the forest for the, for the, for the hunt that, that your people uh, depend upon. And so did mine. So my people did that too. And then uh, now, now everyone depends on the hunt because the hunt is very important to all of us, as is the, the harvest. So just wanted to acknowledge, Grandfather, that the thunder beings are still following their sacred instructions during the summer, during the actually actual spring, summer, and fall. They uh, bring the purifying rains that cleanse Mother Earth and gives her a drink. So they're, they're, they're very important. They, nothing would survive without the thunder beings. So we're very, we're very happy that they're still following their sacred instructions. Grandfather, grandmother, so be it in their minds. We also want to acknowledge the four protectors. They are the, the, the celestial beings that look after all spiritual matters. They work with the spirit helpers. They work with uh, the angels some people call them, but we call them the spirit helpers because they help guide us. They help us with our belief, with our faith. And it, it's that through that intuitive side of our being, we listen, we can hear, we can hear what they're saying to us. And they never tell us anything wrong. They always tell us the truth because they are a spiritual guidance system for us. And if we develop that and we start listening to it and being guided by it, then our faith and our, and our belief become stronger and stronger and stronger, like we have been doing for the past you know, quite a few decades now. Anyways, I just want to acknowledge that the spirit helpers are still following their sacred instructions. The four protectors are still following their sacred instructions because they're working for Saguan Bison, the Geminado, the creator, the maker of our bodies. And the creator put us here because everything we need is right here, right here in the Great Lakes watershed. We don't need to go anywhere else to, to get the medicines. The medicines are right here. The medicines that we need in order to survive are right here. Uh, the food, the harvest, the hunt, everything is right here. And all we have to do is if we want, it to, if we want that DNA, if we want that to come back as strong as ever, every year, all we have to do is give thanks. All we have to do is uh, do a ceremony of Thanksgiving. And that's what our ceremonial uh, protocols are all about, giving thanks. So just want to acknowledge that grandfather, grandmother, that we are still following our sacred instructions as well as human beings. So we just want to acknowledge the, 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 the maple sap that's coming. I hope that everyone goes out to the sugar bush, get, bring, take out your five gallon jugs and uh, get them to fill it up because they'll fill it up quickly with the maple sap and then just drink a glass of it and try it. 
try and see. No, that's when Mary Louie, that's when you do your water ceremonies with maple sap. Yes, yes. And that's that's everyone. Every, some people are kind of hesitant because they they don't want to drink something that comes from the yeah, earth yeah. or from the tree. But uh, when they drink it, they say, yeah, that, that's that's sweet water, isn't it? And you mm -hmm. say, well, that's what that's what waka means. That, mm -hmm. That's what enatek means. It means sweet water. Mm -hmm. And that's why the maple tree is the principal tree of all the trees because it's the first tree that gives its medicine to all of us for all of us to survive. So grandfather, grandmother, we just want to say in the spirit of our ancestors, all my relations, done a toll, I hike. Oh, Tatuaski. Okay, now we'll turn it back over to you. Yes, Usher, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Lou and Dan. Your words, your performance, your teachings are just so moving, so thought provoking. It was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for um, your gratitude to the Embassy Cultural House, but the truth is we're honored to be in your midst, your presence. It's so important for us to learn about your stories and your teachings and for us to come together and have these conversations. And so on behalf of everyone, I just wanna say that we salute your bravery, your courage, the stories of your peoples, um, your parents, your ancestors. There's, you know, etched in Canadian history is this brutal past that some of us may fail to acknowledge at times, that some of us may not understand or may not fully grasp the gravity of, but we're so thankful for you to be here, for, for, for you to teach us about your beliefs, your teachings. I really hope that Western scholarship and Western science is able to recognize the beautiful teachings of your peoples and integrate that in our daily life and daily activities and work together towards building that better future and acknowledging that we all come from Mother Earth and that we should protect and cherish her. And so thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Oh, sorry. I did. I heard dream. I catcher. just noticed you had a dream catcher on your wall. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. So those are the words from me. Um, we'll be moving on now. Um, and so I am happy to be turning our attention to a video that was created by the wonderful Imogen Clendenning, uh, who, like me, is pursuing her master's in art history at the Department of Visual Arts at Western University. Um, this video essentially documents the contributions and cont contributors to Pandemic Gardens. Imogen definitely put in a lot of hard work into it. So thank you so much, Imogen. And I'll be turning it to Olivia to share this video. So thank you.
just to let everybody know that that video uh, will be available on um, YouTube um, in a couple of days. Um, and just to say thanks again, um, that was courtesy of Imogen, who um, is one of our team members uh, at the ECH. Yeah, thank you so much, Olivia, for sharing that. And again, thank you so big shout out to Imogen Plantenic for putting that together. Um, it was a lot of work, so thank you so much, Imogen. We really hope you enjoyed that. Um, now I'm going to be opening up the floor to our contributors. Um, we're going to be hearing a little bit from them regarding their work to Pandemic Gardens, their contribution to Pandemic Gardens, perhaps what encouraged them, what Pandemic Gardens means to them. So without further ado, I'm going to be introducing Olivia Masudo, our first speaker, and she'll be saying a few words about her work in Pandemic Gardens. Take it away, Olivia. Um, thank you, Usher. Uh, it feels very strange to spotlight myself, but uh, Ron um, convinced me that it had to be done. Uh, so um, I was, I've, I've been part of the embassy since it started in um, uh, October 2020. And uh, since then, I've learned a lot. And I've learned a lot from Ron and from Jamili and pretty much everybody that I've had the chance to meet. And um, my pandemic gardens contribution is really just um, an ode to that. It's a thank you. Um, I feel like the thing that I'm most grateful for during the pandemic and um, throughout my time with Ron and Jamili, uh, throughout my time gardening and meeting people um, is that I've just learned so much and I'm very, very grateful for it. Um, I guess a little bit of a backstory is that Ron and Shamili took me on as their uh, studio assistant um, at the start of the pandemic. And since then I've been helping with odds and ends and the embassy and Ron's garden. And um, it, it's uh, probably the best job I've ever had. <laughs> And um, yeah, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm just very grateful to be here. And I'm um, like, uh, like Dan and Mary Lou, I'm, I'm grateful for Ron and Jamili's uh, friendship and for their mentorship. Um, I'm another person, another young person like Usher and Joanna and a lot of the people on the ECH team who have just um, had a chance to uh, learn so much and grow as a result of this opportunity and experience. And um, I, I really, I really, I'm just very thankful and I'll just leave it at that. So thank you, Usher. Thank you so much, Olivia. Those were beautiful words. And yeah, you're absolutely right. We are so grateful to Ron and Jamily for taking us under their wing and for teaching us so much. So yeah, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to be moving on to Joanna Wheel, who not only contributed to Pandemic Gardens, but put in a lot of effort into the exhibition as a whole. So thank you so much for that, Joanna. And the floor is all yours. Take it away. Hi, thank you. Um, so I can talk a little bit about my contribution. Um, it was 2020, it was, um, maybe about like May, June. The world was sort of in lockdown. Um, my sister and I were back at our parents' house and all four of us didn't have anywhere to go. My parents were working from a home. Um, school finished, online school finished. And same for my sister. And we were unemployed for the, for like the time being because um, there just weren't really a lot of jobs, especially for us who we tend to work with like kids and in a, uh, we lifeguard. So all that, all that type of stuff was closed. Or we really didn't have anything to do. Um, so we decided why not? start a little garden in the backyard. Um, our mom wasn't super excited about it at first because it meant that we were gonna have to dig up the backyard, but um, she settled for us using some planters instead. Um, so we grew lettuce and planters uh, or we did the best that we could. And it was just nice, it was nice to get outside and sort of have a hobby, something that you looked, you looked at every day considering we really didn't have much else going on. We sort of had to invent new hobbies. and that is what we decided to do. Um, I really enjoyed working on this project. It was definitely the highlight of um, my last semester interning for the ECH. And um, I had a really good, had a fun time putting together um, everyone else's contributions on the website. Everyone's work looks so good. And um, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this on Jamaili. 
Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your words, Joanna. That was really kind. Um, all right, I'm going to turn our attention to Winsome, who's joining us from uh, Toronto. She'll be saying a few words about her contribution. So take it all away, Winsome. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I just realized I was muted. Um, yes, I'm in Toronto, cold, cold Toronto with horns down the road. I can hear horns down below. But when I did the project, I was in Belize and I was looking after a garden. I had six and a half acres and was looking after gardens. But then I started looking after this. So during the pandemic, I had this um, jackfruit tree that just wouldn't do very well. And I'm um, like talking to it that it has to do well. I want a jackfruit from it. It's the property was up for sale and lo and behold it started to blossom and so I started taking more pride in it and doing more work to it and the next thing I knew the toucans were watching me and taking an interest in this project and soon we had a full jackfruit that was ripe and we could eat it and I thought and then I got thankfully from Ron um an embassy house asking me if I would take part in this project. So I started photographing it and, uh, and just amazing because embassy house doesn't realize, cultural center doesn't realize how much because I'm in Belize away from all the art projects and everything. But by the, this was the second or third time they invited me to be involved in stuff. And it just helped me to pass the time and feel like I was with other artists. And that's how the project came about. Thanks to embassy. And I'm trying to live up to my name of Winsome Winsome, which means covering the ocean. So I cover the ocean and take it back. Thank you so much, Winsome. That was very beautiful. Um, all right, now we're gonna be hearing from uh, Lisa Hermer. Hi everyone. Um, so my contribution was um, from this garden, which is currently underway together with my collaborator, Christina Kingsbury. Uh, we planted a small version of it last summer and uh, we'll make a bigger version of it this summer. Um, and the project actually started with um, the failure of a project. So originally it was going to be a photo based work about the ways that we relate to other beings through our senses and how the beings that align best with our senses tend to be the ones we focus on. So sort of charismatic megafauna and glamorous bees and butterflies. So it was a work that looked at um, sort of small beings that uh, fly around in the night. Um, and it didn't really work as a photo project. So when my friend Christina suggested collaborating on something during the pandemic, um, I sort of said, kind of exhausted, like, well, unless you want to plant a garden, I don't know what we're going to do. And very quickly, uh, we were like, well, wait, actually, that makes a whole lot of sense. So Christina has a lot of experience uh, making gardens. And I had all this sort of material that wasn't working about moths. And just very quickly, all these pieces fell into place in a way that felt almost magical. It's been the easiest project I've ever done in the way that sort of a site showed up within days and some funding and then some more funding. Um, and so I'm just really grateful for this garden. And so it's a garden that is meant to be experienced at night. So people will come in the dark um, and it's just a place to uh, spend time with beings that maybe you can't see. Awesome, thank you so much for your words, Lisa. I really appreciate that. Um, now we're gonna be hearing from Carl Beveridge. Okay, and and Carol Condry. <laughs> After all, the title of the piece is Carol's Garden. So um, anyway, we're both here. I know my name's up on the, the screen only, and I should have corrected that before we started. But before we begin talking about our piece, I'll just show you the garden now, which is what our shot is. Can you see what you got? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. Covered in snow now. Um, well, I have to, to thank Ron and Rachel because it was their invitation that inspired the work. As many people during the pandemic, we kept wondering, what can we do? Um, because in a sense, your mind kind of goes 
um, sort of foggy and um, because you're not being stimulated by interacting with other people and being in the kind of social world, being all alone. And at the time that uh, we got the invite from Ron and Rachel, we were thinking about the wildfires in uh, British Columbia that were raging across the province at that time. And the thought occurred to us, gardens. Okay, well, we got a garden and what if it caught on fire? Like many gardens were in BC and around the world because not only were they burning forests and towns, but they were burning people's gardens. And, um, and uh, so that was the idea that uh, sort of hit us. So we had, as you can see in the image, um, Carol's watering the garden because she's the main guardian custodian. And I am playing the, um, the bullheaded um, capitalist pouring gasoline on the fire. Um, and then we have other kinds of symbols and, and uh, ideas in there, including a snake in the tree, because we realized, okay, one of the famous gardens is the Garden of Eden. And there was a slightly kind of biblical nature to the image in that it had three kind of sections, which imitate the kind of altarpieces, medieval religious altarpieces. So, um, and then other things we have in there are on the table we put in various props describing what the situation was. And the main thing is the headline and the newspaper, which is code red, which was just being issued at that point in terms of climate change. So while I realized that pandemic gardens is the celebration of gardens, we were putting a kind of another note on it in terms of the coming crisis and the fact that we may lose our gardens if we don't take action now. Anyway, Carl. No, no, it's, it's a very good call, very good call. <laughs> keep going, keep going. And Carl's sitting here crocheting. I'm looking at rug, yeah, right. So anyway, um, thank you very much, um, Asher and, and Ron and Rachel and Jamili, of course, for inviting us. And this is, I think, our third exhibition. So during the pandemic, the Embassy Cultural House has become one of our main activities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl and Carol. My sincerest apologies for not introducing you, Carol. Carl, Carl, you're absolutely right. I just saw your name and so it slipped my mind, but thank you so much for sharing your story. It's definitely a very interesting piece. So thank you for that. Um, last but not least, we're gonna be hearing from Patricia Dedman. Hey, Patricia. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting to, um, to uh, say a, a big shout out um, and I apologize, I don't have a working camera. <laughs> so technology, uh, I'm at the mercy of. But again, I just wanna say thank you to everyone and to Ron and Jamili um, for um, this opportunity. And um, it's um, really a time to kind of just also be very reflective and, um, my just giving a little bit of background um my work has always been about the landscape and our relationships to to the land and looking at that history and looking at all those interconnections and it's just wonderful to see everyone because again uh, along my journey my path um have i've met several of you along my journey and uh I remember looking for for bear out in uh, <laughs> uh, Alberta with Sandra and and uh, I have a lot of questions in my own practice and so um, I'm very fortunate to um, ask a lot of those questions and in, in terms of being able to uh, bring a you know that kind of First Nations perspective to the forefront because it is a shared land it is a shared space and time and um, uh, we all share this world and um, I, it's, it's a history that I have more questions of and um, I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to be able to tug at those threads and to uh, continue working on and um, looking at gardens and those relationships and um, how that's used as a metaphor for Indigenous cultures throughout the world. and. Um, what um, our teachings um, have to offer and to share with one another. Uh, I think it's so important and uh, to understand, you know, those 
those terminologies and the languages that we speak because we don't necessarily talk the same language. And I am very privileged to be back home on um, working at Six Nations and um, having accessibility to language, our material culture. And um, it's not all about uh, a tragic history, but rather a celebration as well of those those cultures um, of what we we do in everyday life, whether it's through music, dance, uh, film, theater. Uh, it doesn't matter what tools that we're using. It is all about um, that resilience, and um, I think that's what connects us with you know with this pandemic garden is that cultural survival um, through knowledge. And so I'm very grateful. And um, thank you for that opportunity. So thanks. Nyo Wei. Thank you so much for your very important words, Patricia. Definitely echoes what uh, Dan and Mary Lou were saying earlier. So thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm also going to be calling on uh, Vera Tamari to be talking about their piece. So take it away, Vera. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm talking I'm talking to you from Palestine and I wish to thank everyone for especially Ron and Rachel and Jamile and the rest of the team for inviting me to participate in this wonderful exhibition which was coincided with a, with a, with the work that I had done in 2020 last year which was called the um, uh, seed control exhibition which was made in Palestine about 33 seeds, which the, the, during the British mandate in the 1940s, they have uh, decided to exterminate, to to contact, to 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 what, destroy 33 weeds and seeds that they thought were not uh, were, were were not good for the Palestinian landscape, for the agriculture and everything else. Disregarding the fact that the local people in Palestine had a, a reason and an understanding for every seed and every weed in nature. And uh, yet these, these seeds were selected by these people who wanted to just uh, do an indust industrial farming and stuff like that and allowed the destruction of these seeds. So the exhibition that I participated in was, uh, I was invited to do um, a sculptural piece like 33 other artists who were invited to do a sculpture piece to represent each of the seats which were on the list to be uh, destroyed. Um, it is, my, 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 my work is very much connected, has always been connected with nature. And uh, I consider, I'm not a gardener myself, but I consider myself very much rooted with the Palestinian landscape and uh, follow uh, all the things that are happening, unfortunately, I'd like to talk a little bit about it uh, in the Palestinian landscape with the destruction of olive trees on daily basis. Every day we will hear about tens and tens and tens of olive trees being uprooted and destroyed by settler communities who are not allowed to be here in the first place and the, the, the destruction of uh, saplings, vine saplings all over. So it's, it's a very sad story. I mean, there's a lot of destruction in the landscape to build the, uh, the apartheid wall that separates us from the natural surroundings. And uh, it, I, I can go on and on, but I don't want to take much time except to say how fortunate I was to be part of this great exhibition um, online exhibition, and especially because of my old, old friendship with Jamile, who actually uh, was the person behind inviting me to, to, to participate. I, I feel very grateful for everyone who has put some work, very important work in this. I feel we are all united in one cause to, to enjoy nature, no matter what. I mean, to try to make it the best of our situations and to propagate what's beautiful in, in, in our surroundings and so that life can go on and with, with fairness and freedom and justice to everyone. I don't want to be preaching, but uh, this is how I feel. I mean, 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much moved by, by how much there is change in our landscape and, and in Palestine because of the occupation and the destruction of uh, our natural heritage. Thank you very much again for uh, allowing me to be part of this great, great exhibition, Ron and Rachel and all the team, and Joanna, Olive, Olivia, can't remember. Asher, now I met you for the first time. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much, Vera. It was great to meet you as well. Your work is very important. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm <laughs> sure it's probably late there in Palestine, 9, 10 p.m. And so thank you for taking some time and for being here with us. We stand with you. So thank you so much. Um, lastly, we're going to be hearing from uh, Martin Jetson. Good day. I'm truly flattered that uh, Ron and uh, Rachel would invite me to contribute to this magnificent uh, project. I, I'm not a gardener myself, but uh, being a fairly solitary individual and enjoy my solitude, uh, my, my garden is my haven and uh, I just like to spend a, a lot of time in it. I look at it and I walk around in it uh, and I do uh, some gardening but I was really quite pleased actually when the pandemic started because it just immediately put the break on the frenzy of life and enabled me to just uh, focus on being with myself and uh, interacting in what ways I wanted to with, with nature. And so when Ron uh, and I were talking one day and he just wanted me to make a a small contribution. I really didn't think I had anything to offer, but he just seemed to uh, feel that anything I could uh, show would be of benefit. And so I did. I took that photograph of a hanging basket, which was given to me by somebody. And to have it sort of uh, pulled down by some raccoons uh, was really upsetting when I pulled back the curtains and found the site that I scurried out into the garden and in the driving rain, picked up those plants and put them back. And I was talking to them and patting them down and saying, you've got to survive, you've got to survive because it just means so much. And it was the memory of the person who'd given them to me. And uh, you know, the, the plant is still surviving. It's come indoors now for the winter, but I still talk to it every, every day, give it a little bit of water. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that it will survive until April and it will go back out onto that shepherd's crook. But uh, I think this, the whole exhibition has shown how much uh, power there is in nature and how much we have to learn, contribute. And uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to get away from the, the busyness of life. And this pandemic has shown that there is, there is some untapped power and beauty that we're just not taking the time to, uh, to appreciate. And too much of our land is being concreted over and destroyed and built on, but uh, this, this project has shown us that we must uh, reevaluate that. So thank you so much, Ron and uh, Rachel for letting me to contribute and I've really enjoyed everybody's uh, narrative this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Those were some very powerful words. I definitely stand with you in what you were saying. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to everyone that's spoken so far, Olivia, Joanna, Vera, Winsome, Martin, Lisa, Carol, Carl, and Patricia. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna open up the floor now to our other contributors. Um, if you'd like to say something about your work, jump in maybe and talk a little bit about what you did and what Pandemic Gardens means for you or what the pandemic overall meant for you, then um, I'm happy to sort of moderate. So yeah, I'm just gonna open up the floor and we'll go from there. And I know it's hard to sort of talk about your work, but Sandra, we have our first <laughs> somebody to speak. Awesome. <laughs> so as I, somebody had to begin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to the elders for the teachings and for the songs and for locating us on that land. And thank you to everybody there. I wanted just to um, read the poem that, that goes, goes with my piece which is called uh, Catching Myself in the Act of Making Land. 
And uh, I'll, just, I'll read the piece and then just briefly talk to you about it. She raised her arms above her head and shook, shook hard. She shook off the roots that ran through the desiccated grass and filled what remained of the waters. She shook off the fur and the lizard skin and the feathers and the fear. And she ran to the tree and stopped. And from her throat came a song she half knew, a song that moved her hands, that moved her feet, her jaw, knees, her hips and thighs, that moved her hands, her nose and her ears in the intricate ballet of a mother's sway and warmth. In Saskatchewan, there was the pandemic, but there was also a drought. So it was, a, it was a hard time for the plants and the grass all turned very, very light, light yellow. And the trees, we had planted over 60 trees, my dad and I on this little piece of land on the lake. We're having a hard time. And I was doing what I could, I could to help but we were having odd weather coming at the same time. So we had this big hailstorm, and in the pool in front of the, of the house, the, 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 the reeds that had planted themselves in the pool got very badly damaged. So I grabbed a hold of that land that they had created and I pulled it back onto the land so that the roots were exposed, turning things upside down, turning things upside down. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Sandra. And um, it looks like Jamile, we've got Jamile. Yeah, I was gonna say perhaps Alberto in uh, Corrientes, Argentina, and Dot in Toronto. It's an example actually of our beautiful contributors who've mm -hmm. been involved in, like Sandra and many of you in a number of our projects um, and are, having to deal with this separation in their relationship and creatively working together across this divide, across the distances and managed to make this contribution to the Embassy Culture House. Alberto, if you're there and able and uh, Dot together, yeah, I'm we'd love some, to hear from you. Hi, I'm having some problem with my connection uh, because it's very hot here, so it's a lot of power we use. So I want to turn off my, my video, my camera, and I want to talk. So, sorry. And Dot, maybe Dot wants to come on beside you. I don't know, Olivia, if you can- Oh, no. That. Ah, okay. Um, it's- Together. I don't think we can be together. We're in two different parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Olivia can do magic. Oh, can she? Okay. Alberto's <laughs> gonna speak from his ah, father. There you are. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. speak for the global self and then i'm going to disappear too okay uh, no, just okay. stay on just stay on okay. it's alberto okay. it's lovely um okay i was i was not prepared for this but anyway so um thank you to the embassy cultural house for giving us the chance to participate and all the idea of the garden and pandemic um was very important idea because force us again, I think, and to look and thinking again about the relation between human and nature. Um, thinking about the pandemic and, on, and I, the idea of this pandemic, at the beginning, almost two years ago, when, when we're thinking about the after the pandemic, we will be very human being, and, and that, that's really not happened. Um, and because the for many reasons, but the social inequality 
is bigger than ever, bigger than before. Few people are more rich and rich and millions of people are more poor, poor. So uh, the majority of the people around the world who die in this pandemic are poor people. And this is, is telling us many things for many reasons. So our wish to be better is not happening. And the garden, this is what I was thinking, this is what we're thinking when we're talking and, and the, the idea to do the garden, is remind us the nature is, is our natural refugees as a human. Um, but we are destroying this. Right now, in, in, in the country, in Argentina, in particular in this province, there are a hundred of fires in the countryside. Um, I'm thinking that the, um, this, uh, this is the first time something happened like us. I'm thinking this region is a waterland surrounded by big rivers. Now all the river, all the lagoon are very low. And it's telling us something. And it's telling us something about our relationship with nature. And so I'm taking the word of the Marilu and, and Dan when they say, we should speak for the water. Actually, when we talk about water and we speak about water, we speak in, uh, uh, about life. And that is important for me, for us, for those, when we're talking about this idea of the garden. So, uh, because in many ways, the garden, the nature remember us who we are and where we are. So thank you very much, Jamil. Thank you very much, Ron. And thank you very much all the people from Embassy House for the chance to talk and say some idea about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you. Take care. Maybe I'll just close by thanking everyone here and thanking everyone who's spoken it's meant a lot. It's a very grounding experience. And I just want to say um, behind me is a wonderful painting by Alberto, a blue painting of the Guarani world. And then on one side actually is The Fall of Water by Carol Conte and Carol Beveridge, <laughs> uh, which they made uh, a number of years ago to talk about the way in which water is being extracted and how important it is that there are water protectors in the world. So I do wanna circle around again and thank Mary Lou and Dan Smoke um, for their wise counsel and generosity and Ron and Jamili and everyone who works at the Embassy House for everything that they've done. And thank you, Alberto, for your um, speaking, for, uh, speaking from the global South in this particular moment, thanks. We do have a bit more time if, if uh, anyone else wants to join in this conversation or respond to the artworks, uh, not necessarily contributors, but some of you that have joined us who have been amazing um, supporters in different capacities, welcome you. And, and new people who are joining us today from across the country, we're really happy to to welcome you as well. So uh, anyone else? Uh, I know I see Jay Saloon's down there in Mexico. Jace, are you? Uh... I think I'm here. I don't know if the internet is connecting us or not. Let's see. Uh, hey, there we go. hey, 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 Jace. Nice to see you all. Family and strangers. Uh, yeah, I'm very, um, very blessed to be down here. I mean, I'm not the religious type, but I still feel blessed and to be with you all. And I think probably the, I can share, I feel a bit strange because I'm here as an uninvited guest uh, in this beautiful, amazing part of the world. And uh, yeah, the, the, the little photo and text piece I sent was from lemongrass that I had planted 
a friend had brought over one stalk of lemongrass. And because everything is so fertile here in its warmth and humidity, it's now sprouted into a huge bush and there's 30 bushes of, of lemongrass around the yard. So, I mean, just being down here is a constant reminder on a, as beautiful butterflies just fly into the studio, um, of the power of nature and that we are, if you know, way down in the food chain as far as the importance of, of, of the, uh, of the world around us that we have to uh, support and, and get nurtured by and do our best to uh, reciprocate in this cycle of life. So I think I'll, I'll show you some, some things like, let's see, can you see that moth that just joined us? The internet may cut out at any time. But, um, there's, there, there's, um, you can see the banana, whoa, you can see the banana trees down there? I don't know. They're uh, full of bananas. <laughs> And anyways, um, it's, yeah, it's pretty amazing to be here for, for this period of time. I'll be back in rainy cold Vancouver in about 10 days. But um, yeah, I just want to thank you for um, allowing me to be part of your projects. It's, it's really been a nice unifying force throughout the uh, two plus years of the pandemic. I'm very grateful. So thank you. Oh, we totally appreciate your engagement with us, Jason. We've got a long history with you. Our families have long history together, so. Yes, cousin. It's super special <laughs> for everyone. Uh, Jason's family comes from the same village in Lebanon that my mom's family comes from. So we're really uh, have a long history and Jace is one of the early participants in the Embassy Culture House when it was at the Embassy Hotel. So we're we're looking forward to um, the physical space that's going to that is in the process of being built, an affordable housing project on the former site of the hotel. So we hope that and there will be some ongoing cultural programs on that site and a whole initiative taking place so many years later. Uh, Vera Tamari coming on has been absolutely wonderful as well. My friendship with her goes back to um, my first trip to Palestine in 1989. So that's really great to have these relationships over so many decades. So we're re the, the cultural house re-envisaged by Tarek has really given us this gift. We really are grateful. One of the things that uh, I, I've also appreciated was uh, getting to know the um, the Arboretum at the University of Guelph mm -hmm. and uh, meeting Justine Richardson, who's the director, and uh, learning about the Arboretum. Uh, despite the fact that I went to Guelph uh, as an engineering student in 1969, I, di I didn't really know the Arboretum that well, and uh, if at all. And uh, it was through Justine, uh, and uh, I was introduced to Justine by uh, uh, Rene de Cotre, uh, the artist in, outside of Guelph. Julie. But uh, Justine, do you want to say a few words? Uh, say hello? I know you're there. <laughs> Did she go? I don't think she's. I think Justine might uh, have had to leave. Oh, too okay. bad. Okay. 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 Just a shout out to Justine. And um, her words are in the uh, uh, accompanying the website. Yeah, and uh, oh, are we are we muted? No. If you can hear me, we're uh, we're we're planning on doing a, a catalog. Are you, Olivia? Sorry, someone is banging very loudly on my door, and it's just oh. making me nervous. Okay. <laughs> um, um, but yes, we are making a catalog. Um, yeah. And uh, sorry, Ron, did you want me to switch up any of the spotlights? <laughs> No, just uh, I just wanted to say that uh, in the next few months, uh, Olivia and the Embassy Culture House and our fellow uh, um, workers, including myself, will be working on a on the production of a catalog uh, of pandemic gardens, and uh, hopefully that will come out uh, by the late uh, early summer. I hope. <laughs> And uh, all of the contributors will be part of that. And 
also will be doing a garden uh, project uh, in uh, Fredericton as, with um, in con uh, uh, collaboration with Connection Artist Run Center. And uh, it'll have photographs of all the contrib uh, photographs of the contributions by the people who contributed to the online exhibition. And the garden will be planted by uh, like a, an open call actually will be made to children in the Fredericton area to come and plant, uh, help plant the garden. So looking forward to that. I'll be driving out and uh, uh, working with Rachel McGilberry to set that up. So. That's it. Uh, Judith, Roger, would you like to say a few words? You're there. You're put, yes, I'm here. You're putting me on the spot, Ron. I think I really don't have much to say because um, people have been so articulate in saying what these projects that you and Jamili and Tarek have started and organized and all the students that have been involved that um, I think you should really be excited of the pleasure and the um, thoughtfulness that you have brought to all these projects. And I'm privileged to have been involved almost from the beginning and watching it grow. So I wanna say thank you to you as well and to everyone who's been involved. The artists who submitted the work is really nourishing right now, especially when it's so uh, cold outside. I've been a gardener pretty well all my life. And so it's, um, and most recently in trying to restore native plants, I was pleased to see the um, piece about the pawpaws because I have three trees that are now grown fairly significantly and are producing pawpaws, except not, not last summer. And if you've never tasted this native Canadian fruit, you should try to find one because, it, and they can't buy them because they're so fragile that they can't be grown commercially, but there are more and more pod pod trees being planted in this particular area. And so you may have the chance to experience that special taste. I think I'll stop there. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> It was nice to hear your voice, Judith. And um, I know that not everybody has um, spoken, but I I feel like we can also just highlight um, in, in the Zoom call right now, we have a lot of people who have contributed um, but haven't spoken yet. Um, uh, BH Yal, uh, Stephen Cruz, um, Jesse Amory, Gabriella Solti, Martha McGivillery, Ryan White, um, a lot of people. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm still going through the screen. Um, so I just wanted to mention those people as well because they're. Um, I, I really encourage if you want to say anything about your work, um, it, the contributions are just all of each and every one of them are amazing for um, for different reasons. Everybody had their really own um, interesting perspective on what was happening. So um, thank you, everyone. Um, for your contributions. Hi, Olivia. So um, perhaps uh, Asher and Olivia, we could at the end uh, we could uh, replay the uh, the video with the uh, with the sound. That would be fantastic, and people could uh, see it again from the beginning. But thanks, everyone. I uh, it's been a great experience for me to help organize this and uh, just. Uh, just to see everyone again, I, all my friends. And it's been such a, a pretty hard time, but always great to see everyone. Ron, I should just uh, mention that when speaking with Roland Schubert a few weeks back, uh, I said I hadn't received an email back from you, and Roland said, well, Ron's not that quick with the computer, you know. I think I'm <laughs> I think I'm going to have to correct him. You've done a very, very good job, all of you, <laughs> Rachel, too. <laughs> it's it's the team. It's the team, Marcus. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's the team that makes it happen. And that's, um, that's what someone else mentioned. It's And you say it uh, as well, that the team, it's collaboration and connection. 
That's what we all need. And our busyness in our lives have taken us away from connecting and collaborating. We're all on hell bent on me and I, the world revolving around the perpendicular pronoun. We need to get back to basics. Just what uh, Dan Smoke said right at the very beginning. Thanks, thanks so much for what you've all done. Can and thank time. you, and thank you so much for all that you've done your entire life as a healer. So, well, just to just yeah, like every, yeah. what everybody else is doing, we yeah. all can, we all contribute. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks to what everybody. Bye yeah, now. We've Bye. got a great community here, and uh, we just keep things going day by day, and uh, appreciate everyone showing up today. It's been a beautiful afternoon. Sun is shining here on the snow. And uh, we can think about all those other people in the global south enjoying some of the heat. Um, although, as Alberto reminded us um, of the devastation that is happening there um, with climate crisis and as well on top of it, the COVID uh, period and economic disparity. So I think we all want to see this uh, um, change that you're talking about manifested and what we're all working towards that dear Vera spoke about and all of us are working towards that's why we are the community that we are so uh, it's really great afternoon yeah and uh, we could go on I know but we're reaching the hour and a half mark so I'm sure many of you have other things need to do but uh, really really happy to spend this time with you today. Olivia, if you can uh, show the film, that would be great. Yeah, on the way out, um, feel free to and, enjoy the video. Yeah, and, <laughs> and for all the new people, the contributors who are coming into ECH in the very near future, we look forward to doing more projects with you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and I'll just bring things to a close by saying, once again, on behalf of the Embassy Cultural House, thank you so much to all of our amazing contributors, without whom this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you so much to Ron, Rachel, for putting this together with help from Joanna, Jamie Lee, Olivia. It's just been an amazing collaboration. And it's so heartwarming to see all of us coming from different perspectives, different parts of the world, coming together to produce this very unifying and very powerful exhibition that's much needed right now, given all that's going on in our world. And so thank you so much. It was an absolute honor to be your MC today. And it was wonderful to see all of your glowing faces. And yeah, I hope everyone takes care of themselves. Um, take, yeah, spread some kindness, spread love, go enjoy your day or night. <laughs> and yeah, thank you so much again. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Okay. Asher, thank you. Thank you, for for doing Thanks, this. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you.